may by his passion and cross be brought to the glory of his resurrection through the same Christ our Lord. Amen. I'm Father Chet Artishevitz of the Glen Mary Home Missioners, and thank you so much for listening to Sacred Heart Catholic Radio. 740 WNOP Newport, 910 WPFB Middletown, or get the app, stream, podcast, and more at sacredheartradio.com. It is Friday, the 12th of January. Let's begin together in prayer in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Lord, forgive us our pride. Forgive us our stubbornness of heart. Forgive us our anger against one another. Forgive us our greed in all its forms. Forgive us our mercilessness. Forgive us the harm we have done. God of mercy and compassion, you hold out to us the hand of your mercy to raise us up from the misery of our selfish sinfulness and all it has brought upon us and those whose lives we touch. Teach us to weep where we have caused weeping, to mourn where we have caused mourning, and to lift up what we have brought low. In hope and trust, we turn to you for healing through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, God forever and ever. Amen. It is a better way to start a Friday morning. The Sunrise Morning Show. Thanks for listening to the EWTN Global Catholic Radio Network. I'm Matt Swain. Anna Mitchell has news. Paul Ackman at the controls. Travis has a video feed up and running. It's in the show notes at sunrisemorningshow.com. Father Philip Michael Tangora will be along here with us. He is our Canon Law correspondent. Mike Aquilina is going through more cities that were of major importance in the early church. Ken Craycraft discusses a new novel exploring faith and works, and we'll look ahead to the Sunday Mass readings with Father Hezekiah Carnazzo. So stay with us. There's a lot going on. Two minutes past the hour, news a service of Central Fabricators and centralfabricators.com. Here's Anna Mitchell. Good morning. Israel will have its day in international court when it responds to South Africa's claims of genocide today. South Africa has accused the state of committing genocide in Gaza in its war against Hamas and presented its case yesterday to the International Court of Justice. Israel has called the allegation baseless. The Biden administration appears to agree, calling the allegations unfounded. President Biden says strikes from both the U.S. and U.K. against Houthi militants in Yemen are in direct response to Houthi attacks against ships in the Red Sea. More from Mark Mayfield. Biden said in a statement that the attacks endangered U.S. personnel as well as its partners, along with threatening the freedom of navigation. Biden went on to add that the attacks were carried out by both the U.S. and the U.K. with support from Australia, Bahrain, Canada, and the Netherlands. Officials say the attacks hit over a dozen Houthi targets in Yemen, including radar systems and drone storage. I'm Mark Mayfield. People living in the central United States are being told to get ready for extremely cold weather. Forecasters are warning that an Arctic blast of sub-freezing air will be plunging into the lower 48 next week and could set records for daily low temperatures. The northern plains could see temperatures 60 degrees below normal as soon as tomorrow, with highs below zero through the weekend. Bishop Robert Barron has reaffirmed the Pope's condemnation of surrogate motherhood in his recent State of the World address to diplomats at the Holy See. Bishop Barron, who chairs the U.S. Bishops Committee on Laity, Marriage, Family, Life and Youth, released a statement saying, quote, The commercialization of women and children in surrogacy is underlined by the belief that there is a right to have a child. The child becomes an object for fulfillment of one's desires instead of a person to be cherished, he said. In this way, the genuine right of the child to be conceived through the love of his or her parents is overlooked in favor of the right to have a child by any means necessary. We must avoid this way of thinking and answer the call to respect human life, beginning with the unborn child. 
At the same time, he said, we cannot dismiss couples who earnestly want children but have serious obstacles in childbearing themselves. He said the church must accompany these couples, saying, quote, the desire to utilize surrogacy might feel like the desire to form a family naturally, but no matter how well-intentioned, surrogacy always does grave injustice to the child. Any discarded embryos who are our fellow human beings, the commodified birth mother, and the loving union of the spouses, end quote. The bishops of Ecuador this week released a statement calling for unity and fraternity as their country reels from a recent upsurge in gang violence. From Vatican Radio, Lisa Zingarini reports. In the statement titled, Violence Will Not Prevail, the Ecuadorian bishops called on citizens not to fall into panic and be conditioned by social media while reminding them that the fight against gangs is not only the concern of the government but of every citizen. While firmly rejecting violence from whatever side it may come, the Episcopal Conference stated that in the current exceptional circumstances, Ecuadorians must stay united with an eye towards the future and with the strength necessary to make Ecuador what it has always been, a place of peace, work and fraternity. The statement further remarked that any illegal activity at any level of society and state must be considered a betrayal of the homeland, of the most sacred values of the Ecuadorian identity and of God, who they said will be the judge of our lives. According to the Ecuadorian bishops, it is therefore imperative to recover the values of fraternity and peace. Ever since we were children, we have been taught that we are all brothers, calling God our Father, they said. The bishops concluded assuring their prayers for the integrity of every good Ecuadorian and the stability of the state as a guarantee for peace to return to the country as soon as possible. I am Lisa Zingarini. And Bill Belichick and the New England Patriots are ending an historic 24-season run. The team and Belichick announced yesterday they had mutually agreed to part ways. Belichick said he and team owner Robert Kraft came to the decision Wednesday after meeting together. He ends his Patriots career with 266 regular season wins and six Super Bowls. So it'll be interesting to me to see where, if anywhere, he lands after this. I'm sure he will land somewhere. I do not think his NFL situation is done. No. There are a few vacancies out there. Mm-hmm. So we'll see. Yeah. Maybe, you know what? I figured it out. He's going to go coach the University of Alabama. Oh, my gosh. I'm just kidding. I'm, I'm completely kidding. <laughs> that would be crazy. It would be fascinating. Whoa. Would that be? And wow. Nick Saban is your new coach of the New England Patriots. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just Interesting. Kidding. Hey, we got the uh, same pattern memo today. Did we? We were in similar flannels? Yeah. Well, mine's a scarf. Yours is a scarf. But you know what? You know Yours what is else just an accident has in piece. common? I'm wearing this on my whole upper half. Well, the common thread aside from the same. Uh, pun intended. Yeah. Um is that your wife picked out both of these pieces. Oh. This is that this a scarf. Is that a Bass this is Pro a shark, scarf. No, it's like she bought it at like a I don't know, some kind of craft fair for me. Oh yeah. Was yeah. it a Robert Craft Handmade. fair? Was Bill Belichick there? No. But yeah, Colleen Swaim picked out these you know how they, they have this, those, folks. This is why you gotta watch the video feed. Matt and I just NFL end up halftime and... shows, you know, and as they're like fading out, they're like wardrobe by X, like mm-hmm. wardrobe by Colleen Swain. That's, that's it every time. You gotta let her know when she wakes up. Somebody, somebody once told me I was ugly, and my mama dresses me funny. I'm like, no, I may be ugly, but my wife is the one who dresses me funny. <laughs> oh man, well. Today is Friday, January the 12th, the Feast of St. Aylred of Riveau. Next hour, we'll talk to Dr. John Cutterback about his philosophy of friendship. Look forward to that. Right now, it's nine past. Father Philip Michael Tangora is joining us now on the Sunrise Morning Show. He's a pastor, a canon lawyer, and author of Holiness and Living the Sacramental Life. Good morning, Father. 
Good morning, everybody. So, Father, we are returning to the topic of fiducia supplicans, the declaration from the Dicastery for the Doctrine of the Faith on Blessings, which has uh, no shortage of of controversy and and confusion, certainly. Um, The prefect, Cardinal Mm -hmm. Fernandez, uh, issued a press release to try to clarify some things because there was so much confusion and and. I mean, really, a lot of backlash from a lot of bishops, even. He's under um, a lot of stress right now. Yeah, I would, I would say so. He's had, he's had a, a rough month. Bad week. <laughs> yeah, for <laughs> sure. Um, but did you find that press release helpful? No. Hmm. Just, in, I'm sorry to be so blunt and and clear. I, I don't mean to be crass, but uh, I mean it. It actually uh, made things even stranger, mm. uh, especially when uh, in in it, it talked about how uh, the, it gave an example of what the blessing would look like, mm-hmm. it gave, which they said they weren't going to do in the first thing, and then it also says, if two people approach together to seek the blessing, one simply ask the Lord for peace, health, and other good things for these two people who request it. At the same time, one asks that they may live the gospel of Christ in full fidelity, and so that the Holy Spirit can free these two people from everything that does not correspond to His divine will and from everything that requires purification. So that leads me to ask, does the the blessing have to actually say to dissolve their relationship, which is irregular? Mm. Interesting. Because if you're saying that the blessing has to call for them to be faithful to the gospel and to the Holy Spirit— and that they are to be freed from everything that does not correspond to his divine will, well, that would be the irregular relationship that they're in. Right. right. It's a good point. Um, one thing that I was I was curious about, and I know you've written a, a letter to your parish that I'm assuming is going to be coming out in a, a bulletin sometime soon. Um, I want to talk to you about that, but I'm, I'm curious about one thing from that press release before we get to, to some of your thoughts, because I know this got you thinking about the Council sure. of Trent like a, like a good traditionalist priest would. <laughs> um, well, just a good Catholic, period. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's a, that's a great point. Um, I wanted to ask you about one point in this press release, because he talks about making the sign of the cross twice— over each individual, do you think that that can relieve some of the the um, the potential scandal that might result from from blessing two people yeah. who are in an irregular relationship? Well, it, it shows that the blessing is really to each individually, and not them as a couple. So, I mean, that does make uh, some sense, uh, but then, like what we're about to talk about, you know, uh, there's the question of whether the blessing would be absolutely moot to begin with if they're incapable of receiving grace due to their mortal sin, if they're in mortal sin. Well, tell us more about this, because this is where the Council of Trent comes in. Exactly. So on January 13th, 1547, in the sixth session of the Council of Trent, in its decree on justification, Chapters 14 and 15 directly uh, deal with this situation. Chapter 15 even addresses explicitly those who have committed any sort of sexual uh, indiscretion against the Sixth Commandment of the Decalogue. And it it makes very, very clear that Whenever one is culpable for mortal sin, which obviously we have to look at the Catechism of the Catholic Church, specifically paragraphs 1750 through 1754 and 1857 through 1861, to talk about, well, what constitutes uh, mortal sin and all that kind of stuff, as well as 2380 through 2381, 2353, all that, which deal with mortal sin. Uh, Now, what we would say is, because mortal sin is what it is, you know, as its name applies, it severs us from the grace of Christ. One One has become severed from the grace of Christ. So you're incapable of receiving the grace of a blessing. 
if mm-hmm. you're in mortal sin. And that's the big if. It's a conditional, you know. And then the uh, and that's in Chapter 15 of the Decree on Justification. And Chapter 14 states very, very clearly, just as the Catechism does in Number 1856, but Chapter 14 states that the only way for it was for the sake of those who fall into sin after baptism that Jesus Christ instituted the sacrament of penance when he said, Receive mm-hmm. the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven. And if you retain the sins of any, they are retained. Thus, the sacrament of reconciliation is the normative way for us to be restored to a life of grace after having culpably committed any act or acts of mortal sin after bath- our baptism. So the situation would be, if a person is coming who's in an irregular circumstance, and now we're just talking pastorally, okay, and they want to be reconciled with the Church, they want to be reconciled with God, well then wouldn't the proper uh, ministry be the sacrament of reconciliation and not a blessing? Mm -hmm. It's not like the blessing is going to offer them cooperating grace, the gratia cooperans. They're already coming, they're already seeking to cooperate with the Church. It's not like they need a blessing to bring them closer. What they're seeking is reconciliation to God and the Church. Sure. And so what they need is the sacrament of reconciliation, possibly an annulment, and possibly a convalidation of their irregular relationship, not a blessing. Can I ask you just quickly, because we've only got like a minute before we have to let you go here, Father, but... I I want to ask you just a a quick practical question. So there's no way for a priest in the situations that are that are being expressed in in this declaration anyway. You know, somebody comes up to you for a spontaneous blessing um, for a priest to know whether two people are actually in a state of mortal sin when they approach you for for such a blessing. So then as a priest, do you need to start asking questions? Do you just assume that they're in a state no. of mortal sin and encourage confession, or, no, or do you, you bless never, them and you, hope for the best? Yeah, you can never really, unless they're notorious sinners, it's gravely manifest. The presumption has to be that they're coming, and so you give them the blessing. Hmm. But you should also be inviting them, you know, to the sacrament of penance. Sure. And to receive the full reconciliation to the life of the Church. Thank you so much, Father Philip Michael Tangora. Lots to think about there, for sure. We've got Holiness and Living the Sacramental Life linked at sunrisemorningshow.com. 17 past. We're back with headlines right after this. Support for the Sunrise Morning Show is from Visiting Angels. Visiting Angels provides experienced, compassionate care to millions of aging adults nationwide by keeping them safe and healthy in the comfort of their own home. Whether it's a short break for caregivers or for long-term assistance, Visiting Angels provides hygiene, meals, light housework, companionship, and more. And services are available up to 24 hours per day. Visiting Angels, online at visitingangels.com. That's visitingangels.com. Franchise opportunities available. For more than 150 years, the Comboni missionaries have served the poorest and most forgotten people. With our founders and Daniel Comboni as an inspiration, we work for the full development of the human person through evangelization, education, and advocacy. Your donations make a huge impact, and 95% are used to fund our many projects. Find out more at ComboniMissionaries.org. That is ComboniMissionaries.org. Business owners are starting to think outside the box to find new customers. You can reach millions of engaged Catholic listeners by underwriting The Sunrise Morning Show. Each weekday morning, listeners across the U.S. and around the globe can hear your message for your business, ministry, or nonprofit on The Sunrise Morning Show. To find out how it works, email me, Leah, at sacredheartradio.com. That's Leah at sacredheartradio.com. Hi, this is Mike Aquilina with a few words about St. John Chrysostom. 
St. John Chrysostom is probably the most famous Christian preacher in all of history. His name, which is really a nickname, Chrysostom, means golden mouth. It was given to him because of his preaching. People went to Mass just to hear him preach. St. John Chrysostom was a hero, and he taught us how to speak the truth, but also how to live by that truth, even if we're called to live it heroically. 19 past, here's Anna with headlines. Israel will have its day in international court today to respond to South Africa's accusation of genocide against Palestinians in Gaza. President Biden says strikes from both U.S. and U.K. against Houthi militants in Yemen are in direct response to Houthi attacks against ships in the Red Sea. And the 51st National March for Life is just one week away and we'll have a slightly different route this year. All right, next newscast coming up at half past the hour. Over the weekend, Anna Mitchell, we actually get to celebrate the feast of an Indian convert, martyr, saint, St. Devasahayam Pillai, the first Indian layman and convert to be canonized by the church. He was canonized May 15th, 2022. Uh, the announcement had come out a few days earlier, and it just so happened that on <laughs> uh, May 10th of that year, we were taping an episode of The Journey Home, and one of the people we were taping with was a Hindu convert. Really? And uh, Wow. Yeah, who is now actually on staff at the Coming Home Network. Her name is Rocky McCormick. Uh, and That's it was awesome. so cool to be, like, sharing a modern-day story of a Hindu convert while wow, we're wow, wow. getting the news of the canonization of the first Indian layman and convert to be canonized. Oh, yeah, by the church. feast day, January 14th. Yeah, it'll be covered up by Sunday. But St. Devasahaya and Palai, pray, pray for, for us. us. You can find a lot of different businesses on Sacred Heart Radio's Angels List, but there are some businesses that we still don't have on the list. Right now is the perfect opportunity for you to reach hundreds of thousands of listeners and be the first business of your kind on our list. If you specialize in child care, appliance repair, pest control, painting, roofing, handyman services, or carpet cleaning, I want to talk to you. Email me, Leah, at sacredheartradio.com, and let's get you on Sacred Heart Radio's Angels List. Working to see the culture of life prevail in the Miami Valley, Dayton Right to Life is here to protect God's gift of life through law, education, and community action, from fertilization to natural death. Find Dayton Right to Life online at DaytonLife.org. That's DaytonLife.org. A wedding is a day. A marriage is a lifetime. Catholic Engaged Encounter Weekends are a marriage preparation program led by married couples and a priest or deacon. This is time for a couple to learn about each other and their upcoming marriage. Based on communication, intimacy, and the family they grew up in. Find out more at cincinnati-covington.engagedencounter.com. That's cincinnati-covington.engagedencounter.com. God creates life. Adoption protects life from abortion. This is Ohio State Representative Tom Brinkman. Please come to the annual Pro-Life Rosary Procession. Pray in reparation for the slaughter of babies and for their mothers and fathers. The annual Pro-Life Rosary Procession and Rally in downtown Cincinnati at City Hall is Saturday, January 20th at 11 a.m. Take the shuttle from Fountain Square Garage to City Hall after 10 a.m. Stay for the Fountain Square Rally at noon. More information at CincinnatiProLife.org. St. Michael's Rosaries and Religious Articles, a proud supporter of Sacred Heart Radio, can help you share your faith in style with high-quality socks and T-shirts featuring your favorite saints and the Blessed Mother. St. Michael's Rosaries in beautiful Miamisburg or online at stmichaelscustomrosaries.com. The Sunrise Morning Show continues, and from fathersofthechurch.com, we're joined now by Mike Aquilina, who's been going through various cities that are of major importance in early church history. Today, we get to talk about Edessa. Mike, good morning. Morning, Matt. Well, first of all, where is Edessa? Well, it's in a place that people don't usually associate with early Christianity, but it was a vibrant center of early Christianity. We're talking about Asia Minor. It, it wasn't terribly far from Cappadocia and some of the other lands, but Edessa usually doesn't get a lot of notice because it was a borderland between the Roman Empire and the Persian Empire. Now, people, for a lot of reasons, tend to identify uh, the, the Christianity with the Roman Empire. They think that, that uh, 
you know, one was was in the other, that the Christians were fighting their battles against the, the Roman Empire and they were persecuted by the Roman Empire. And that's true, but it's not the only place on uh, on on Earth where 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 um, where Christians were persecuted. They were persecuted also by the other great empire, the Persian Empire. Uh, it, the Persians didn't trust Christians. They didn't. They, you know, they had their own religion, and they believed that Christians uh, were uh, were spies for the Romans. Uh, you know, today you'll you'll hear people uh, make this mistake in identification. E even as great a writer, a Catholic writer as Hilaire Belloc said that the faith is Europe, and Europe is the faith, and he says it many times in. Um, in his books, um, you know, he says, Europe is the church, and the church is Europe. The faith is Europe, and Europe is the faith. So he's identifying Christianity with Europe. But as you and I have, have realized, that it wasn't just Europe. You know, we talked about um, about the, the, the great influence that the African lands had on the development of early Christianity. And, you know, if we're going to be honest, and if we're going to understand the dynamics of early Christianity and its development, we have to acknowledge that the Persian lands were also involved in this, and they played a very important role in the development of earliest Christianity. So, Edessa had a hard time of it. Being a borderland, sometimes they were Persian, sometimes they were Roman, and it's one of these, these, these places, these cities that get batted back and forth you know it's like a match of tennis with this with the lives of these people it they, it got batted back and forth negotiated back and forth between the persians and the romans you watch some of those time lapse maps of you know that part of the world and see how the border shifted and how radically they shifted and how often they shifted but i would imagine that if the romans have their own kind of sort of theological and political persuasions and the Persians have their own theological and political persuasions. There are things about Christianity that would make a certain sense to a Roman mind, and there were certain would be certain things that would make sense to a Persian mind. Mm -hmm. So uh, I, I wonder what kinds of things come out of the Christianity that survives in Edessa. Hmm. Yeah, interesting. There, there's, you know, the one thing that they they had going for them, the Christians in Edessa, was that was that the language spoken by Edessans was uh, Syriac, and Syriac was a, a close cousin of the language spoken by Jesus himself. It's a, it was a close cousin of the Aramaic that was spoken in Palestine at the time of Christ. Uh, so you have um, you you have this uh, affinity towards Semitic culture. There was an understanding of Semitic religion in in Edessa that you just don't get anywhere else. So we read the the, the writings of the the Syriac fathers. Uh, Ephraim comes to mind and Afrahat comes to mind and and you find that it's a very Jewish Christianity. It has the feel of of uh, the history of Israel, it has an understanding of the the history of Israel and it's, and a certain ownership of it. So many of these these early Edessan Christians were probably Jews, and they were very intelligent, very informed Jews. They had they had an understanding of uh, of biblical history, and so that's something that contributed to the development there. And Ephraim, it said, wrote thousands of hymns, and these hymns are just shot through with his understanding of the Old Testament and its typology pointing forward to the New Testament. So Edessa is, uh, is just tremendously valuable in the literary history and, uh, and, and other aspects of history, too, of the Christian church. Well, you mentioned Ephraim the Syrian, doctor of yeah. the church, and Aphrahat. Anybody else we should know from that area? Well, you know, the super celebrity is St. Jude. St. Jude, uh, you know, uh, he's he's got all the devotion these days. It's a 20th century phenomenon. But, there, you know, in the last century, there was an explosion of devotion to Jude as the patron of, uh, of difficult cases, lost causes, however you want to say it. Uh, so there is a lot of devotion to Jude. And it's said that Jude founded the church there. Now, he wasn't he wasn't the, the first one. To, to evangelize Edessa, because in the account of it that we have, his arrival there, uh, we, 
we see that there were already Christians there. And what he did was he gathered them together and he, and he took the most mature of them, their, their men, and he, um, he ordained them to the priesthood because you can't have a church uh, until you have the mass. So he really founded the church in Edessa, even though he wasn't the first to evangelize it. So yeah, I'd, I'd point to St. Jude as the, the first Christian super celebrity there. You know, you have one of the apostles evangelizing your city. Well, you've got a lot more to say about Edessa, and uh, you've got a podcast at catholicculture.org on your Way of the Father's work that you've been doing, which Dr. Jim Papandrea has also now taken up. Uh, And we've got catholicculture.org linked at sunrisemorningshow.com so people can check that out. But if listeners want to find your work, your books, uh, and the things that you've done to help explore and explain the early history of the church, how do they find you? Well, the best place to find my books at the best price is catholicbooksdirect.com, catholicbooksdirect.com. My own website is fathersofthechurch.com. It's all linked at sunrisemorningshow.com. Mike, thank you as always. Have a great day. Thanks for having me on, Matt. Half past, here's Anna with news. Good morning. People living in the central U.S. are being told to get ready for extremely cold weather. Forecasters are warning that an Arctic blast of sub-freezing air will be plunging into the lower 48 states next week and could set records for daily low temperatures. The northern plains could see temperatures 60 degrees below normal as soon as tomorrow with highs below zero through the weekend. By Monday, temperatures in the single digits could reach as far south as Amarillo, Texas, and as far east as Indianapolis. Daily cold records could also be set from the northwest to the Gulf Coast from Saturday through Tuesday. Israel will have its day in international court as it responds to South Africa's claims of genocide today. South Africa has accused the Jewish state of committing genocide in Gaza and its war against Hamas and presented the case yesterday to the International Court of Justice. Israel has called the allegation baseless. The Biden administration agrees, calling the allegations unfounded. President Biden has said strikes from both U.S. and U.K. against Houthi militants in Yemen are in, quote, direct response to Houthi attacks against ships in the Red Sea. More from Mark Mayfield. Biden said in a statement that the attacks endangered U.S. personnel as well as its partners, along with threatening the freedom of navigation. Biden went on to add that the attacks were carried out by both the U.S. and the U.K. with support from Australia, Bahrain, Canada, and the Netherlands. Officials say the attacks hit over a dozen Houthi targets in Yemen, including radar systems and drone storage. I'm Mark Mayfield. The 51st National March for Life is just one week away and will have a slightly different route this year. Organizers say in order to mark not only our victory in Dobbs, but also our need to maintain a presence in Washington, we will also march past the Capitol and finish between the Capitol and Supreme Court, saying, quote, we will give witness to the inherent dignity of the human person to pro-life and pro-abortion legislators legislators alike, helping them understand that we will not cease advocating for women and children until every life is protected, end quote. Pope Francis met yesterday with members of an institute of secular priests, stressing that secularity means serving and bearing witness to the kingdom of God in this world. From Vatican Radio, Joseph Tollock reports. Members of the Institute of the Missionary Priests of the Kingship of Christ are diocesan or secular rather than religious priests. They live in various parts of the world under the jurisdiction of local bishops. Their encounter with the Pope took place as part of the Institute's 70th anniversary celebrations and members presented Pope Francis with the floor plan of a new training centre under construction in Burundi. Pope Francis began his speech by underlining the value of secularity in the life and ministry of priests. Secularity, he stressed, is not synonymous with secularism. Secularity, he said, is in fact a dimension of the church, having to do with its mission to serve and bear witness to the kingdom of God in this world. It follows from this, said the Pope, that priests, as well as lay people, are called to live secularity out. Pope Francis went on to praise the priest's way of living out this secular vocation. Members of the Institute, he said, live according to the Franciscan charism and are thus formed for humble, available and fraternal service. Pope Francis brought his speech to a close by quoting a line from the Institute's Prayer to the Sacred Heart, which members recite every day. 
May we be in solidarity with and friends of the people, apostles of kindness and truth, so that the gospel might become the heart of the world. End quote. The Secular Institute of the Missionary Priests of the Kingship of Christ was established in October 1953 in the Church of St. Damiano in Assisi. The centre which the Institute is constructing in Burundi will be dedicated to Archbishop Michael Courtney, who served as the Apostolic Nuncio to the country from 2000 and was shot to death there in 2003. He played a significant role in national reconciliation in the country. I'm Joseph Tullock. The bishops of Ecuador are calling for unity and fraternity as their country reels from an upsurge recently in gang violence. The Catholic News Agency reports the bishops put out a statement this week as a state of emergency had been declared in the wake of several gang-related disturbances, including the takeover of a television station. The bishops said in their statement, quote, any activity contrary to the law in any area of society in the state must be considered a betrayal of the homeland, the most sacred values of what it means to be Ecuadorian, and God, who will be the judge of our lives, end quote. And the Knights of Columbus have announced a project to restore the baldacchino over the high altar in St. Peter's Basilica in Rome ahead of the 2025 Jubilee year. That's the news. It's 35 past the hour. When you go to sacredheartradio.com and click subscribe, your inbox will let you know when your favorite guest will be on the Sunrise Morning Show and driving home the faith. To know when your favorite guests are on, go to sacredheartradio.com and click subscribe. Schneller Knockelman Plumbing, Heating, and Air is a proud supporter of Sacred Heart Radio. Stay warm and comfortable during the coldest of weather with Schneller Knockelman for your heating repair, replacement, and maintenance. Find us at skpha.com, skpha.com. Pregnancy Center West is committed to protecting the unborn by encouraging women to see and choose the beauty of life while offering practical assistance for them and their families. Donate securely online at supportpcw.org. That's supportpcw.org. Sacred Heart Radio is blessed to have the support of Larkin Cobb Chevrolet Buick GMC in Eaton, Ohio, offering a wide range of new and used cars, trucks, and SUVs with on-site financing. Larkin Cobb, close to Eaton, Richmond, Dayton, and Brookville. On the web at larkincobb.com. It's 24 minutes before the hour on this feast of St. Aylred of Riveau, Friday, January the 12th. Your forecast is brought to you on Sacred Heart Catholic Radio by Schneller Knockeman Plumbing, Heating, and Air online at skpha.com. Precipitation returns today. Right now, temperatures in the upper 30s as you're heading out the door. For Cincinnati, rain is likely could be heavy at times with gusty afternoon and evening winds and a high today of 50 degrees. A wintry mix turns to wet snow tonight, but little to no accumulation, an overnight low of 25. Colder and windy tomorrow under mostly cloudy skies with a high of 30. For the Miami Valley Dayton area, rain and snow showers turning to all rain today. Windy as well with a high of 48. Rain this evening mixing and changing to scattered snow showers with an overnight low of 24. Cloudy, windy with a few flurries possible tomorrow and a high of 28. This is Sacred Heart Catholic Radio. It's 37 minutes past the hour. You're listening to the Sunrise Morning Show on the EWTN Global Catholic Radio Network. So happy to have you along with us on this Feast of St. Aylred of Rivo. Sunrise Morning Show legal, political, sometimes cultural and moral theology analyst Ken Craycraft back with us now. He's a professor at Mount St. Mary's Seminary. He writes for the Catholic Telegraph and our Sunday visitor, among other publications. Good morning, Ken. Good morning, Annie. Good to be with you again. It is good to have you. And you've got an interesting piece over at our Sunday Visitor, which begins with a reflection on a famous passage from the letter of St. James, in which he talks about how faith without works is dead. But how about the opposite? Are works without faith dead? And I know that you uh, just read a book that explores this very question. It's called Absolution by Alice McDermott. Now, first of all, tell us about the author. Well, Alice McDermott is, I'm, I'm 
probably convinced because of her latest novel, the most important Catholic novelist living today, wow. and certainly probably one of the top five or ten Catholic novelists in U.S. history. She really has made her place as uh, uh, one of the greats in the in the literary fiction tradition of the United States, uh, especially uh, as a Catholic author. I mean, she's been writing for a very long time. Her first novel was called A Bigamous Daughter. It was written in 1986. Uh, her novel That Night, her second novel, uh, which some regard as her greatest novel, uh, actually was a finalist for the National Book Award and the Penn mm. Faulkner Award for Fiction. That Night is a wonderful book exploring a, a teenager's crisis pregnancy and the response of the community around her. It's, it's a wonderful book. Uh, and other books such as Charming Billy and At Weddings and Wakes. Up until her latest novel, my favorite of her novels is one called The Ninth Hour. Um, and the reason that I like it so much is the story of a, a young, very young uh, woman who has been widowed, uh, and she has a young child, and she has nowhere to go and nothing to do uh, to support herself, and she's taken in by a community of nursing nuns, and mm. for the rest of her life does laundry for these nursing nuns, and it's a wonderful, wonderful story about the theology of work, the theology of faith and repentance uh, and forgiveness. So. Uh, she's uh, she's in my mind one of the great uh, American novelists and perhaps the greatest American Catholic novelist living today, wow. uh, and that leads up to her her new novel uh, just published uh, early or late I'm sorry last year in 2023 uh, a novel called Absolution. So give us the plot of Absolution. Well. McDermott writes mostly, and in fact almost solely, I think, about people who are from her native Brooklyn. Uh, and and uh, Long Island more generally, uh, yeah. uh, native, native home, her home. And, and she most, writes mostly about women and the experiences of women. And Absolution ties both of those together. Now, the book is not set in Long Island or New York. It's set in Saigon, Vietnam. Hmm. But the, uh, the, the person who tells the story, the narrator of the story, is, is from uh, New York, from Long Island. And uh, the, the story is what's called an epistolary novel. It's an exchange of letters between two people. And the, the subject of the letter mostly is a woman named Charlene, who was the best friend of the person who writes the longest letter in the novel. Her, her name is Patricia. And Charlene's daughter, Patricia and Char Patricia and uh, and uh, and the daughter's name is Rainey. Patricia and Rainey knew each other in Saigon in 1963, but not very well because Patricia was a newlywed who had moved there with her husband, an engineer uh, who was a civilian, but who, who had been assigned to the military in the early years of the war. Mm. And Charlene was Rainey's mother, and Rainey is the other letter writer. And and but Rainey was just a pre-adolescent at the time. The novel, though, is written eight, some sixty years later, when Patricia is in her eighties and Rainey is now in her seventies. And it tells the story of Charlene, Rainey's mother and Patricia's best friend. And this is why I thought about works and faith uh, in this piece in Our Sunday Visitor. And I asked the question, are works without faith dead? Charlene is a whirlwind of charitable endeavors in Vietnam. Uh, she enters into a scheme to import illegally Barbie dolls into the U.S. And keep in mind, this is 1963, the heart of the Barbie doll craze. Mm -hmm. And uh, she makes clothes for them or hires people to make clothes for them and distributes them to poor children and dispossessed children from the war in Vietnam. And she does lots of other charitable things. But along the way, she's always cutting corners. She's always doing things that in Patricia's mind seem to be, if not on the verge of illegality, uh, illegal themselves. And so Patricia uh -huh. is puzzled by Charlene's whirlwind of charitable activity, but also by her seeming lack of any kind of rootedness in faith. In other words, her works don't seem to be motivated by any kind of genuine Christian or other religious faith, but by something that Patricia can't quite name. Now, Charlene is a nominal Episcopalian, but it's certainly not any kind of presence in her life, whereas Patricia is a mass-going uh, Catholic with her husband. And so she begins with her faith, and her work springs from that, but she doesn't understand Charlene's faith. And, and because of that, Patricia puzzles over it while she's living in Vietnam with uh, Charlene, or near Charlene. And then it all becomes clearer as the novel progresses when Charlene's daughter, now in her 
70s responds to uh, Patricia's letter to explain things that happened after Charlene left Vietnam, uh, after Patricia left Vietnam, with Lene and, and her life after that. Wow. So I'm assuming you can't tell us what happens afterwards. I'm, I'm guessing that would kind of spoil well, everything. Well, no, I don't want to spoil the novel for the reader because uh, there are a couple of surprises, including uh, the culmination of the novel, which is, or near the culmination of the novel, which is a, a, a shocking and, and, mm. and, and heartbreaking event. And I certainly wouldn't reveal that. I will say this, however, that, um, and I do say in the piece, so um, Charlene, it, so this is 60 years after the events in Vietnam. So Charlene uh, is described by Patricia and her mother as uh, as having uh, descended into uh, what we might call a, a a kind of frenetic and and alcoholic and drug uh, uh, supported um, a, a tendency and sort of uh, obsession to do good works to do good things. Hmm. Uh, but there's nothing that Patricia can see about Charlene that acknowledges that Patricia that Charlene is doing these good works as an expression of faith. And so what Patricia has to surmise and what she does surmise is that there's there's a demon in Charlene that drives her to do things that actually do do good for people but that actually are not doing good for Charlene mm. because it actually is doing the opposite. It's actually eating at Charlene's soul oh, because wow. she doesn't regard, she doesn't require, she doesn't regard any kind of steps that she takes to do, achieve some good as illegitimate. Any means will, Justify will support the, the, will support the, the end that she seeks. Yeah. And, and so the good works, Patricia thinks, are not saving Charlene, as a matter of fact, because she's so obsessed with, with them, without any clear view of what their purpose is, the good works seem to be de destroying Charlene's soul. And it's a, it's a very powerful meditation on the need for absolution. That's the name of the book, because what Patricia sees is that Charlene is seeking absolution. She doesn't know what from, but she does know that Charlene is seeking it in all the wrong ways. And that's and and when we look at it that way, Annie, we see Char we see ourselves in Charlene oftentimes when we think that we can save ourselves by our good works. And that's really what James is about. And there's the Protestant uh, accusation against Catholics is that we 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 say that works can save us, which of course is is not true. We don't say that at all. We say that the merits of Christ save us, the resurrection of Christ saves us. But we do acknowledge that works can bear grace both to the person who does them and to the person who receives them. Works are grace-bearing, just like many other things are grace-bearing, sacramentals and so forth. But for Charlene, works were not grace-bearing because they were not worked in the context of the gospel, something that she seemed not to understand. And so Charlene's quest for absolution through good works seemed to Patricia to be futile. And I think that's a lesson that we can learn from the novel in a very powerful way as we look at the way that she struggles with, with wanting to be redeemed, but not knowing how. Whoa. There's so much more that I would love to talk to you about concerning this theme, and perhaps we can pick it up some other time, Ken, because there's so much more to be said about living in the image yes. after the likeness of Jesus Christ when it comes to our good works and how that works toward our salvation. But sadly, we've run out of time today. So I encourage folks to go uh, read your piece over at our Sunday Visitor, which is linked at sunrisemorningshow.com. Ken, thank you. Thank you, Annie. All right. It is 13 till. Father Hezekiah Carnazzo joins us next. Support is from Solidarity Health Share. Do you have an insurance plan that pays for everything, even things that violate your beliefs? Have you ever felt there has to be a better way, but didn't know you had any options? If you answered yes, I've got some good news for you. There is a better way and a more affordable way. Solidarity Health Share can save you hundreds of dollars each month while actually supporting your beliefs. Because the best news is that Solidarity Health Share costs a whole lot less than insurance. It's time to jump in and put your money where your faith is and put some money back into your wallet at the same time. Join Solidarity Health Share, a faith based healthcare sharing community. Prices start as low as $384 a month for families. Call to see how much you can save 844 334 3245. 
That's 844-334-3245. Solidarity HealthShare, 844-334-3245. If the cold winter mornings make you want to stay in bed, it's time to get some Mystic Monk coffee or tea to help make kicking off the covers a little easier. And when you head to their site by clicking the link at sunrisemorningshow.com, you earn us a commission on your purchase without spending anything extra. While you're at our site, be sure to check out our online store where you can buy Sunrise Morning Show mugs and travel mugs. Get a mug and link to Mystic Monk Coffee at sonrisemorningshow.com. That's sunrisemorningshow.com. The most original Catholic content is on EWTN Radio. On Mother Angelica Answering the Call, Father Joseph and Doug Keck mine decades of phone calls answered by Mother Angelica. No subject is off limits and no problem too big for the wisdom and compassion of the one and only Mother Angelica. Mother Angelica Answering the Call, Sunday afternoon, 2 Eastern, on EWTN Radio. us on the Sunrise Morning Show is Father Hezekiah Carnazzo from the Institute of Catholic Culture. Good morning, Father. Welcome back. Good morning, Annie. It's such a blessing to be with you and all of your listeners this morning. It is a blessing to have you back. And we are looking at the second Sunday in Ordinary Time. And so let's look at these readings, just kind of a general theme that I I sort of see here in in the first reading and in the gospel. So the first reading is 1 Samuel chapter 3, and we hear the Lord calling Samuel by name. And then in the gospel, John chapter 1, we see Jesus calling Peter by name, well, calling him Simon first and then changing his name to Peter right there on the spot. Can you speak to the importance of names to our Lord? Well, I think just on the, at least on the surface level, Annie, it's just very important that to realize that the Lord knows us, each one of us, individually and personally. We can get in this kind of concept, this idea that that God is distant from us, but he's not. He's present here and now in my life, only waiting for us to respond to him, which is what we see in the first reading from Samuel, um, First Samuel chapter 3, I think we do well to get out of our Bibles and read the whole chapter, the story of the, the life of the boy Samuel as he's sleeping in the tent of meeting. He's close to the Lord, and the Lord speaks to him, and he calls him three times. And it's only after the third time that Samuel responds to him. There's a, there's a big lesson to be learned here. Besides the fact that the Lord is present, calling us personally, the Lord is also patient with us. We're going to see that also in the gospel. There's multiple times in which the disciples are called by the Lord, and also in our life. We may have been Catholic since we were, uh, you know, a baby. Uh, Maybe not. Maybe we're a convert. But the calling of the Lord takes place throughout our life, and He's only waiting for us to respond to Him. Well, let's unpack this gospel a little bit in John chapter 1. So John the Baptist is there with two of his disciples. Jesus walks by, and he says, Behold, the Lamb of God! And those two disciples just pick up and follow Jesus. And I find it interesting. Jesus turns around and looks at them and says, what are you looking for? And they say, Rabbi, (laughs) where are you staying? And then Jesus says, come and you will see. And they spent the day with Jesus. And then they couldn't wait any longer. They had to go bring more people to him. These questions are exactly the questions we need to be asking, Annie, and we need to place ourselves within the story and let those questions that take place, that conversation which takes place between the Lord and these two disciples of John the Baptist, to be questions that are asked of us. Number one, are we willing to go and meet the Lord? Are we willing to go and, and, and seek Him out? Are we willing, in a sense, to sleep in the temple of meeting, to prepare our hearts to encounter Him? And then, and notice how it says, come and see. There's, a, there's, there's more, than, more than just come and see where I'm staying, of course. John wants us to understand, this is John the Evangelist, is writing this. John wants us to understand that there's a deep encounter which must us in the Lord. And then you're right to point out this, the results of it, Annie. And it's the same in the re, with, uh, with First Samuel. What is the result of this encounter with the Lord? In the first reading in the Old Testament, it says that the Lord was with him. The Samuel grew up not permitting any word of his to be without effect. And it's the same thing that happens here in the gospel. The encounter takes place between the Lord and these these disciples of John the Baptist, and immediately they leave him. 
you say, well, don't, they would want to stay with Jesus, right? I want to stay there, I'll always be close to the Lord. No, because the, the Lord is now present in our hearts, and they must now go out and in their word proclaim the truth of what they've encountered to others to bring them to Christ. And this, I think, is the fundamental message which the, which, which the church wants us uh, to understand here. And I'm, gonna, I'm just going to bring – let me tie in for, for all of our listeners this morning the responsorial psalm that is so beautiful. How here, – here am I, Lord. I come to do your will. I have waited and waited for the Lord, and he stooped toward me and heard my cry. That's very incarnational, right, that Jesus mm-hmm. comes and is born of the Virgin Mary. And he put a new song into my mouth, a hymn to our God. This is, this is the gift of God's life within us which then, once we realize what we have, of course, there's nothing left but to sing, right? To sing and to dance once you, once you encounter the Lord. And that hymn now is a hymn which is my entire life. Uh, I am a walking proclamation of the truth of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, the gift of his life in my life. And Father, as I listen to you speak, I mean, what I, what I find myself reflecting on and hope that, that you can, can comment on this is I think about those two disciples who were with John the Baptist. And when John said, behold, the Lamb of God, they had a choice to make, didn't they? They, had a, they mm-hmm. could stay with, with their comfort zone, stay there with the one that they already knew, or they could take the chance and go and follow the Lamb of God. And I think that we in our lives have that same kind of choice to make don't we? We are confronted with the truth. What do we do with it? Yeah, this is what this is what Saint Paul says in, his, in the epistle to First Corinthians chapter six. He says, "You are a temple of the Holy Spirit. Do you realize what happened to you on the day of your baptism? You have been made one with Christ, and now your life is hidden in Christ. It is no longer I who live, but it's Christ who lives in me." Saint Paul says. Therefore, proclaim this encounter. This transformation has taken place in you. Proclaim it in your body, St. Paul says in the epistle. You are a walking temple of the Holy Spirit, and you're given a choice whether you're going to allow that to shine beautifully in your life or going to hide it. Of course, we we cannot hide it once we realize what has taken place in our life. We are the temple of the Holy Spirit, the Church of Jesus Christ, for the sake of the salvation of the world. We've been talking to Father Hezekiah Carnazzo. And Father, if listeners want to connect with you, check out what's going on over at the Institute. How do they find it? Yeah, it's from instituteofcatholicculture.org. We're entering upon a semester, really a year-long course, uh, with Dr. John Papino from the Fraternity of St. Peter's Seminary with Patristics 101 and 102. This is going to be a wonderful opportunity to dive deep into the insights and writings of the Church Fathers Institute of Catholic Culture.org. Institute of Catholic Culture.org. Come and join us. And you can find Institute of Catholic Culture.org linked at sunrise morning show.com. That patristics course, you want to learn about the church fathers? Registration technically closed last night, but I got a little inside track. It's still open this morning. So you better get it in. Uh, get in your registration in the next hour or so, instituteofcatholicculture.org. Come join me. I'll be moderating that course. We got another hour of the Sunrise Morning Show coming up after a quick break for most of our affiliates here on EWTN Radio. If you just received Sacred Heart Radio's Christmas newsletter, then you also receive the QR card for everyone to scan our QR code and get the Sacred Heart Radio app. Then they can hear us on their smartphone from anywhere and car radio through Bluetooth, where it sounds better than FM and never fades no matter where they travel. So to shine the light of Christ into every soul you know, flash the QR card and share the media source you use to hear the good news. Sacred Heart Radio and the Sacred Heart Radio app. Support for Sacred Heart Radio is from Rua Wood Psychological Services, integrating psychological science and the truths of our Catholic faith with offices in Dayton and Cincinnati. More information at 513-407-8878 or rwpsych.org. Support comes from On a Mission to Love for books, handcrafted gifts for baptism, communion, confirmation, wedding, birthdays, and more, all deeply based in the rosary and devotion to our Holy Mother. 
onamissiontolove.com. That's onamissiontolove.com. Wimberg Landscaping, a proud supporter of Sacred Heart Radio, has been beautifying properties for over 40 years. Wimberg offers professional one-stop landscaping services from initial design and installation of all plant materials and hardscapes to ongoing maintenance, including lawn service, leaf and snow removal. Wimberg Landscaping, 513-271-2332 or on the web at wimberglandscaping.com. That's wimberglandscaping.com. Hi, this is John Kennedy, a State Farm agent and a proud supporter of Sacred Heart Radio. If you need life insurance, I can help process the best options for you and your family. You can reach me at 859-485-2000 or online at johnkennedyinsurance.com. Start your new year with purpose. Gate of Heaven Cemetery of the Archdiocese of Cincinnati is here to help you understand church teachings to assist your loved ones tomorrow by thinking ahead today. Gate of Heaven Cemetery's free pre-planning seminar is on Tuesday, January 23rd, offering three time slots for your convenience, 11 a.m., 2 p.m., or 6 p.m. For reservations, 513-489-0300 or email community at gateofheaven.org. The Cincinnati Chapter of Legatus is a national network of Catholic business owners, CEOs, and managing partners facing the challenges of faith, family, and business each day. We meet once a month with our spouse for a mass, dinner, and speaker. We have the support of the Archdiocese of Cincinnati and many members throughout the parishes, including yours. We would appreciate the chance to share what we are about with you and enjoy Mass together soon. Contact us at Cincinnati at Legatus.org. That's Cincinnati at Legatus.org. This is Cardinal Raymond Burke. Thank you for listening to Sacred Heart Catholic Radio. 740 WNOP Newport, 910 WPFB Middletown, or get the app, stream, podcast, and more at SacredHeartRadio.com. Sacred Heart Radio. Friday the 12th of January. It's the Feast of St. Aelred of Raveau. Let's pray a prayer written by him in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Lord, may your good sweet spirit descend into my heart and fashion there a dwelling for himself, cleansing it from all defilement both of flesh and spirit, and pouring into it the increment of faith and hope and love, disposing it to penitence and love and gentleness. May he quench with the dew of his blessing the heat of my desires, and with his power put to death my carnal impulses and fleshly lusts. In labors and in watchings and in fastings may he afford my fervor and discretion to love and praise thee, to pray and think of thee, and may he give me power and devotion to order every act and thought according to thy will, and also perseverance in these virtues unto my life's end. Amen. St. Aelred of Raveau, pray for us. He is not one of the most famous of the saints on the calendar, but it is his feast today, and he is a fascinating, fascinating fellow. I'm Matt Swaim. Anna Mitchell has news. Paul Lockman at the controls. Travis has a video feed up and running. You can access that. It's at uh, sunrisemorningshow.com in the show notes. Uh, speaking of Aelred of Raveau, Dr. John Cutterback will discuss what St. Aelred had to say about friendship. And you talk about something that everybody has trouble figuring out in 2024. It's how to have, like, an actual friendship. Well, St. Aelred actually focused pretty hard on this question, and we'll talk about that with Dr. Cutterback. Marlon De La Torre will join us from Knowing is Doing. Uh, we'll also talk to Bobby Schindler from the Terry Schiavo Life and Hope Network, and Father Jonathan Duncan from the Diocese of Charleston will look ahead to the Sunday Mass readings. So, hope you can stay with us. Right now, it is two minutes past the hour. News of service of Central Fabricators and centralfabricators.com. Here's Anna Mitchell. Good morning. The Biden administration says allegations that Israel has committed genocide in Gaza are unfounded. A State Department spokesman said such allegations should be made with the greatest of care this coming as South Africa yesterday presented its case to the International Court of Justice accusing Israel of genocide in its war against Hamas. 
Israel will have its day in court today. A watchdog report finds the Pentagon did not properly track more than a billion dollars worth of weapons sent to Ukraine. The Pentagon Inspector General says that the Defense Department improved its ability to track military aid to Ukraine, but it didn't fully comply with requirements. The report says much of the equipment sent is, quote, delinquent. That means it is not possible to inventory everything sent to Ukraine. This all comes at a crucial moment on the Hill as Congress debates whether to authorize more aid to Ukraine. People living in the central United States are being told to get ready for extremely cold weather. More from Mark Mayfield. Forecasters are warning that an Arctic blast of sub-freezing air will be plunging into the lower 48 states next week and could set records for daily low temperatures. The northern plains could see temperatures 60 degrees below normal as soon as Saturday, with highs below zero through the weekend. By Monday, temperatures in the single digits could reach as far south as Amarillo, Texas, and as far east as Indianapolis. Daily cold records could also be set from the northwest to the Gulf Coast from Saturday through Tuesday. I'm Mark Mayfield. Bishop Robert Barron has reaffirmed the Pope's condemnation of surrogacy in his recent State of the World Address to diplomats at the Holy See. Bishop Barron, who chairs the U.S. Bishop's Committee on Laity, Marriage, Family, Life, and Youth, released a statement saying, quote, The commercialization of women and children in surrogacy is underlined by the belief that there is a right to have a child. The child becomes an object for the fulfillment of one's desires instead of a person to be cherished. In this way, the genuine right of the child to be conceived through the love of his or her parents is overlooked in favor of the right to have a child by any means necessary. He said, we must avoid this way of thinking and answer the call to respect human life, beginning with the unborn child. At the same time, he said, we cannot dismiss couples who earnestly want children but have serious obstacles in childbearing themselves and said, the church must accompany these couples. He said, quote, the desire to utilize surrogacy might feel like the desire to form a family naturally, but no matter how well-intentioned, surrogacy always does grave injustice to the child, any discarded embryos who are our fellow human beings, the commodified birth mother, and the loving union of the spouses, end quote. The bishops of Ecuador this week released a statement calling for unity and fraternity as their country reels from a recent upsurge in gang violence. From Vatican Radio, Lisa Zingarini reports. In the statement titled, Violence Will Not Prevail, the Ecuadorian bishops called on citizens not to fall into panic and be conditioned by social media while reminding them that the fight against gangs is not only the concern of the government but of every citizen. While firmly rejecting violence from whatever side it may come, the Episcopal Conference stated that in the current exceptional circumstances, Ecuadorians must stay united with an eye towards the future and with the strength necessary to make Ecuador what it has always been, a place of peace, work and fraternity. The statement further remarked that any illegal activity at any level of society and state must be considered a betrayal of the homeland, of the most sacred values of the Ecuadorian identity and of God, who they said will be the judge of our lives. According to the Ecuadorian bishops, it is therefore imperative to recover the values of fraternity and peace. Ever since we were children, we have been taught that we are all brothers, calling God our Father, they said. The bishops concluded assuring their prayers for the integrity of every good Ecuadorian and the stability of the state as a guarantee for peace to return to the country as soon as possible. I am Lisa Zingarini. The Knights of Columbus are announcing a project to restore the Baldacchino over the high altar in St. Peter's Basilica in Rome. Vatican News reports the Knights will fund the 10-month, $768,000 effort as part of preparation for the 2025 Jubilee year. This will be the first systematic and complete restoration of the Bernini creation since the work began on it almost 400 years ago. And Fruit Stripe Gum is being discontinued. The iconic gum featured fruit-inspired flavors, a zebra print wrapper, and a zebra mascot on the package. It was 
first sold in the 1960s and came with a temporary tattoo of Yipes the Zebra. I never got one of those. Ferrera, which owns the other candy brand, other candy brands like Nerds and Fun Dip, said the decision to discontinue Fruit Stripe was difficult, but those looking to get their hands on the gum might still be able to find it at retailers across the country before it sells out one final time. Matt, I didn't know that Fruit Stripe gum was still on the market, but I feel like part of my childhood has just died. Yipes. Yipes. Stripes. Yeah. So uh, there's a great line from G.K. Chesterton where he talks about the, the idea, and this is not a slight on your noble profession, Anna Mitchell, because oh, you're the journalist. I'm the, I'm the peanut gallery. Mm-hmm. But that journalism largely consists in saying Lord Jones is dead to people who never knew Lord Jones was alive. <laughs> so uh, today, in your particular case, this journalism is... has consisted of you saying fruit stripe gum is dead to those who did not realize that fruit, dri- fruit, right. fruit stripe gum, gum was, was still, still alive. alive. I do remember I it. No, but I'm a little sad. There was like a zebra There's... involved. Yeah. Well, this was the... This was the gum I always wanted when I was a kid. Okay. It had I was like more like the a bubble gum, tape guy. The gum was, oh, I did. Oh, it's six feet of bubble gum for you, not, not them. them. Isn't it amazing uh, how many gum commercial slogans we remember? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I wanted fruit stripe, bubble tape. That's, I, I had forgotten about bubble tape. Juicy fruit also was, juicy was fruit. bound to move me. Yeah. Oh gosh! And I also what was wanted that to double song? Double my pleasure and double my fun, double. with double mint. I'm trying to remember the extra stuff, but I can't. I can't. Hubba Bubba, <laughs> is Hubba Bubba discontinued yet? Oh boy, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Well, we gotta. I'm gonna have to chew on this one for a little while. <laughs> oh dear. I'm sorry, Anna Mitchell. You, you, I'm going to blame you for this entire segment. I'm sorry. You were to blame for everything. Oh, we're having a little trouble getting Dr. John Cutterback at the moment, so we got to keep talking. Can you? you? You want me to parade more gum references out there? Triple Dent Gum will make you smile, Anna Mitchell. Wow. I'm like, do you remember back in the day I got you like a... It was a it's Christmas That big present. red freshness goes right through it. Your fresh breath goes on and on while you chew it. Neat. I, I So this okay, this actually comes back to something we've talked about with Catherine Fishlock, something actually I think we've talked about with Dr. Cutterback before and mo- possibly even Dr. Jared Stout. The idea of when you sing things, you remember them. And it turns out that the gum the gum industry knows this. Do we have Dr. Cutter back? We do. All right. It's 11 past. Back with us now on the Sunrise Morning Show. Well, I thought we had Dr. Cutterback. Hang on. Back with us now on the Sunrise Show is Dr. John Cutterback. He is a philosophy professor at Christendom College. You can find him and his resources, which are all free, online at life-craft.org. And he's author of the book, True Friendship, Where Virtue Becomes Happiness. A new edition just recently came out from Ignatius Press. Good morning, Dr. Cutterback. Good morning, Annie. So we're discussing St. Aelred of Rivo today. His feast is January 12th, and uh, he was a 12th century Cistercian abbot who wrote a book called Spiritual Friendship, and you dedicate a new chapter in your book to his teachings on friendship. So, Doc, we hear in the book of Revelation, Jesus is the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. What are the implications of that truth when it comes to the meaning and nature of friendship? How you put your question. Thank you. There it is. I mean, this is this is this is Saint Alred's incredible insight about about friendship. That really, for me, was so it was so life changing. It was it was so perspective changing. That the main assertion is not that it's not that another great teacher on on friendship. St. Thomas Aquinas, it's not that St. Thomas doesn't think this, but St. Howard just hones in on it. And that's why he's just such a great guide in this. 
an, an inspiration that God's plan to draw us to friendship with himself, so that's the great end of human life, the goal, that that gives reason to everything else that God does for us, with us, that he's drawing us towards friendship with himself. That that is the origin of his arranging all of the relationships in our life and calling us to live in specific ways in them. And so, so you can simply put it, friendship with God is the beginning and the end of everything in our life, including and especially the relationships and friendships that we have. In other words, that they, their ultimate meaning comes from serving friendship with God, helping us prepare for friendship with God. That's the very reason for their coming to be at all. And it's that from which should arise the richest relationships in our life should arise from a shared love for God and focus on him. So friendship, if we're taking it seriously, is meant to prepare us for friendship in the next life. Um, that's <laughs> quite, uh, I mean, wow, when you think about it that exactly. way, because how many of us just kind of fall into what we think is a friendship? I mean, what is required to have a true yeah. friendship, Dr. Cutterback? Yeah. Well, and again, that's the exact right question to ask, because when, you, when we think about that, Annie, it helps us see more clearly how, you might say, the, the very nature of friendship itself shows us how it is intrinsically a honing thing, something to bring us to become more ourselves. And so here, St. Albert holds in his it's the, it's the bread and butter of Aristotle and St. Thomas Aquinas, Real friendship demands growth and virtue. Real friendship demands that we have a certain character. And, you know, we, we can see this in our own experience. We, the, the more we go on in life, whether it's the friendship in marriage or, or all the, any of the other major friendships in life, to really be able to do in them what we are called to do, what clearly those relationships themselves are calling for, it requires that we grow in character. And there it is. Wow. Oh, actually, this is not an accident. This isn't a whoops. Well, that worked out nicely. <laughs> Everything is divine providence. Everything is a plan to make us be more that way. So I just, I, I, love, I love to stop and do a quick meditation of look around in your life. Look at the relationships that you're, that you're challenged in, that you're struggling in, and, and, and realize God is intimately a part of this. God is intentionally giving us the opportunity to discover something about himself, something about ourselves, something about what he's calling us to do by recognizing even in those relationships that are not going as well as they could have, that's part of the plan too. That's going to grow us too. Well, thank you so much, Dr. John Cutterback. You can find his website, life-craft.org, linked at Sunrise Morning Show. Dot com. Go pick up a book, uh, copy of his book on friendship, uh, where there's a chapter on St. Aylred. Let's take a look at weather across the nation. A lot of people preparing for a lot of cold weather. Low pressure system will be traversing the northeast across the mid-south and into the Great Lakes and strengthening along the way, helping to make storms more intense in some places. The bulk of precipitation will be concentrated this morning along the Mississippi, Mississippi River Valley from the Gulf Coast to Minnesota by evening. It'll shift toward the East Coast. Moderate to heavy snow showers will be taking place across the upper Mississippi Valley through the Great Lakes. Rain showers and thunderstorms will spread from the mid-Mississippi and Ohio Valleys down to the Gulf Coast and into the southeast and mid-Atlantic. Thunderstorms across the deep south and southeast could be severe. High winds are also expected to pose the potential for downed trees and power outages in the Midwest and the deep south through central Appalachia. Out west, snow showers will be commonplace throughout the northern and central Rockies. The Pacific Northwest will get some precipitation snow along the Cascades and rain showers to the west. Few pockets of the nation will stay mostly dry today, including the southwest and the southern high plains. Lots of weather happening. Stay safe out there. 17 past. We got headlines coming up next. Support is from Solidarity Health Share. Do you have an insurance plan that pays for everything? 
even things that violate your beliefs? Have you ever felt there has to be a better way, but didn't know you had any options? If you answered yes, I've got some good news for you. There is a better way and a more affordable way. Solidarity HealthShare can save you hundreds of dollars each month while actually supporting your beliefs. Because the best news is that Solidarity HealthShare costs a whole lot less than insurance. It's time to jump in and put your money where your faith is and put some money back into your wallet at the same time. Join Solidarity HealthShare, a faith-based healthcare sharing community. Prices start as low as $384 a month for families. Call to see how much you can save, 844-334-3245. That's 844-334-3245. Solidarity HealthShare, 844-334-3245. If the cold winter mornings make you want to stay in bed, it's time to get some Mystic Monk coffee or tea to help make kicking off the covers a little easier. And when you head to their site by clicking the link at sunrisemorningshow.com, you earn us a commission on your purchase without spending anything extra. While you're at our site, be sure to check out our online store where you can buy Sunrise Morning Show mugs and travel mugs. Get a mug and link to Mystic Monk Coffee at sonrisemorningshow.com. That's sunrisemorningshow.com. Catechism in a Year with me, Father Mike Schmitz, is coming soon to Catholic Radio. Encounter God's plan of sheer goodness for us, revealed in Scripture and passed down through the tradition of the Catholic faith as we journey together toward our heavenly home. Bible in a Year and Catechism in a Year with Father Mike Schmitz, starting Monday at 10 p.m. Eastern, 7 p.m. Pacific on EWTN Radio. 19 past, here's Anna with headlines. Israel will have its day in international court today to respond to South Africa's claims it's committing genocide in Gaza. The 51st National March for Life is just one week away. It'll have a slightly different route this year. And the Knights of Columbus are announcing a project to restore the Baldacchino in St. Peter's Basilica ahead of the 2025 Jubilee year. I have all kinds of questions during your newscast. Most of them are not really that important to ask. <laughs> but I have I have okay. one related to the Baldacchino. Yeah. Uh, the second question is going to be, what is a Baldacchino? The first okay. question is, is it two C's and one N or one ah, C and two N's? Ah, Baldacchino. B-A. As a bald uh, human, I care. It's like a cappuccino. Okay. No, it's not, actually, because C-H is a k sound in Italian, so baldacchino, right. B-A-L-D-I-C-C-H-I-N-O. So it is two Cs. Baldacchino. One N. Yep. And it's that big, like, twirly thing. Like It looks like a big canopy over the altar at St. Peter's. And now you know. It's 21 past. 2024 is here, and a new year means new opportunities to share the hope that is within us through Sacred Heart Radio's seven media platforms. Sacred Heart Radio needs to be here through 2024 and beyond, and we need your help to make that happen. To give a tax-deductible donation or set up a monthly pledge, visit sacredheartradio.com and click Donate, or use the Venmo app at Sacred Heart Radio. Thank you for your support and telling others about Sacred Heart Radio and the Sacred Heart Radio app. The E6 Catholic Men's Conference is back. Saturday, February 17th, one of the Tri-State's largest events for Catholic men. This year features EWTN host, Catholic Answer Senior Apologist, Tim Staples, Cincinnati Reds Hall of Famer, the Mayor, Sean Casey, Father John Hollowell, and other special guests. E6 is designed to equip men to armor up and be the man Christ calls them to be. Tickets as low as $45 and includes lunch with free parking. Find out more at e6catholicmensconference.com. That's e6catholicmensconference.com. Support for Sacred Heart Radio is from Sunset Janitorial Supply, a Catholic family business supplying the tri-state cleaning industry with commercial cleaning supplies, personal hygiene, equipment, and even machine repair. Free delivery to your business. More information at sunsetjanitorialsupply.com. Many times, the death of a loved one occurs while they are away from home. Depending on the distance, this expense could cost their family tens of thousands of dollars. To help families, the Cincinnati Catholic Cemetery Society offers the Travel Plan, which assists in bringing home a loved one if death occurs more than 100 miles from their residence. A reasonable one-time fee. 
fee provides a lifetime of coverage. Find out more about the travel plan at the Cincinnati Catholic Cemetery Society, 557-2306, extension 319, or online at cccsohio.org. Proud supporter of Sacred Heart Radio, Cincinnati Right to Life ensures that God-given rights are guaranteed for all simply by being human, regardless of age or stage, ability or disability. More information at 1-800-712-HELP. Marlon De La Torre is back with us now on the Sunrise Morning Show, Senior Director of the Department of Evangelization for the Diocese of Columbus. He writes at knowingisdoing.org. Good morning, Marlon. Go Bucks. Good morning, Annie. Go Bucks. So church teaching on sexuality mm. is certainly making the headlines <laughs> lately. Um, uh, there's really, I mean, really no way to cover everything in a short segment like what we have Absolutely. but Absolutely. i want to start here okay. why does the church care at all about sexuality oh gosh it's a beautiful question uh, because we're, we're creatures meant to be intimate first and foremost with god and two we want to be sure that that intimacy is always properly ordered and what i'm what i mean by intimacy is that you you try to always seek the will and the good of the other person. So if God's intention was to to make man, and to make man and woman specifically, to have a a perfect continence or a perfect relationship or a covenant, and that was ruptured, then after that rupture, we are given the opportunity to continue to recover that sacredness and that beauty. Uh, Sexuality is sometimes misinterpreted as purely carnal. Well, there is an element of, of carnality that, yes, of course, there is an intimacy that, that's sexual. But the reality is, prior to that, what animates that, what drives us, is the fact that, that we see each other as perfectly valuable human beings, that we are gifts, and that those gifts and talents manifest themselves in a way where we, we care, we love, we defend, we nurture, we nourish, and all those things are beautiful. That's why the Church puts a great emphasis on human sexuality because it's not just the aspect or the act itself, it's everything behind it that leads to that. That if properly ordered, there is a greater good, a good of love of spouses, and from that love of spouse you have this love of, of, of the greatness and beauty of children, and then you have the beauty of family. And so there's so many things tied to human sexuality that people tend to forget, oh, no, it's just the, why are you bothering, why are you interfering with our personal love life? That's not it. It's basically enhancing and making sure that you properly are ordered to love somebody in a sacrificial way. And so those are all the beautiful elements tied to human sexuality that people tend to forget. Well, you use some key words there, like spouses, for instance, Marlon. At the core, why is sex meant to be between a husband and wife? Gosh, because when you look at the complementarity of of a man and woman, if you put that complement under the bonds of an umbrella of, say, a covenant or a marital covenant, there's something beautiful there. There's something so unique and so distinct. The church recognizes that as the bride of Christ. And being the church, being the bride, she recognizes that looking at her spouse, Jesus Christ, there is a beautiful uh, relationship. We have a covenant. We have beautiful continence here that says, oh, my goodness, I love you. Oh, my Lord, I love you. And so when you look at men and women, you see the will of each other of uh, being offering or giving to one another in perfect humility, in perfect love, charity, uh, and perfect faith. And so the church recognizes that covenant, and that bond is vital for society. It's vital for the properly ordered human condition. Without it, we can't continue. The church recognizes that. And so uh, this gift of sexuality is part of that beautiful covenantal element that allows men and women under the bonds of matrimony to continue to grow, nourish, mature, and really uh, promote Christ uh, very accordingly. And we see the model of the Holy Family of serving as that beautiful gift of relationship that exists that the Church brings forth to us each day. And yet, as you, excuse me, and yet, as you say, um, there is that element of carnality, which means that there can be a lot of temptations for Mm -hmm. us humans who like pleasurable things. And you've Mm -hmm. got a a helpful list over at Knowing is Doing with catechism references of Mm -hmm. 
what you call it, warning signs. I liked how you put that. Warning yeah. signs that you're moving <laughs> into sinful territory as it pertains to sexuality. So tell us about that. You know, it's uh, because we're sexual creatures, and if not properly disposed to be sacrificial with the gift of sexuality, um, certain things can happen, uh, like the sin of lust, where you begin to lose your inhibition, and all you see is that is that physicality of the human being, and that you're only attracted to having your your sexual desires satisfied in a physical way, or uh, having a disordered arousal, where instead of, say, for example, gazing at the beauty of your wife, or you're thinking of something else that's not holy, um, th- that there could be a problem, or that the pleasure of just simply being around another human being, or being around your spouse, or say you have an engaged couple listening to this right now, that it's not enough just to be in the presence of the person and admire and affirm. You need something beyond that. that that's a, a disordered pleasure, that you're not really respecting the dignity of the human person. And what happens is if, if you cross that line, if your intellect will become so desperate for that, then you have the manifestation of evil. Now your intentions are no longer pure or holy. Now you have an evil intent. And, and that evil intent is to satisfy your personal uh, urge, whatever that may be. And then it really reduces the person to a mere object of pleasure. And then if that's not satisfied, then sadness takes over. And, and that's really when you have the problem. That if you're not happy being around the presence of somebody, uh, that you need something else, we've got an issue there. 20 seconds or less. Is it controllable? It is. Absolutely. If, if, you, if your aim is to sacrifice and not seek something in return, absolutely. Short and sweet. Knowingisdoing.org is where you can go read more of this. Check out those catechism references that I was talking about here with Marlon De La Torre. Knowing is doing is linked at sunrisemorningshow.com. Marlon, thank you so much and go Bucks. Appreciate it, Annie. Go Bucks. Oh, and man, Marvin Harrison Jr. declared for the draft yesterday. I knew it was going to happen. I knew it was going to happen. But yeah, a little pang of sadness. We're going to miss him for sure. Go Bucks. Half past the hour now on the Sunrise Morning Show. It's time for news. Israel will have its day in international court when it responds to South Africa's claims of genocide today. South Africa has accused the Jewish state of committing genocide in Gaza in its war against Hamas and presented its case yesterday to the International Court of Justice. Israel is presenting its case today in The Hague after calling the allegation baseless. President Biden says strikes from both the U.S. and U.K. against Houthi militants in Yemen are in, quote, direct response to Houthi attacks against ships in the Red Sea. More from Mark Mayfield. Biden said in a statement that the attacks endangered U.S. personnel as well as its partners, along with threatening the freedom of navigation. Biden went on to add that the attacks were carried out by both the U.S. and the U.K. with support from Australia, Bahrain, Canada, and the Netherlands. Officials say the attacks hit over a dozen Houthi targets in Yemen, including radar systems and drone storage. I'm Mark Mayfield. People living in the central United States are being told to get ready for extremely cold weather. Forecasters are warning that an Arctic blast of sub-freezing air will be plunging into the lower 48 next week and could set records for daily low temperatures. The northern plains could see temperatures 60 degrees below normal as soon as tomorrow, with highs below zero through the weekend. By Monday, temperatures in the single digits could reach as far south as Amarillo, Texas, and as far east as Indianapolis. Daily cold records could also be set from the northwest to the Gulf Coast from tomorrow through Tuesday. The 51st National March for Life is just one week away and will have a slightly different route this year. Organizers say in order to mark not only our victory in Dobbs, but also our need to maintain a presence in Washington, we will also march past the Capitol and finish between the Capitol and the Supreme Court, saying, quote, we will give witness to the inherent dignity of the human person, to pro-life and pro-abortion legislators alike, helping them understand that we will not cease advocating for women and children until every life is protected, end quote. Pope Francis met yesterday with members of an institute of secular priests, stressing that secularity 
means serving and bearing witness to the kingdom of God in this world. From Vatican Radio, Joseph Tullock reports. Members of the Institute of the Missionary Priests of the Kingship of Christ are diocesan or secular rather than religious priests. They live in various parts of the world under the jurisdiction of local bishops. Their encounter with the Pope took place as part of the Institute's 70th anniversary celebrations and members presented Pope Francis with the floor plan of a new training centre under construction in Burundi. Pope Francis began his speech by underlining the value of secularity in the life and ministry of priests. Secularity, he stressed, is not synonymous with secularism. Secularity, he said, is in fact a dimension of the church, having to do with its mission to serve and bear witness to the kingdom of God in this world. It follows from this, said the Pope, that priests, as well as lay people, are called to live secularity out. Pope Francis went on to praise the priest's way of living out this secular vocation. Members of the Institute, he said, live according to the Franciscan charism and are thus formed for humble, available and fraternal service. Pope Francis brought his speech to a close by quoting a line from the Institute's Prayer to the Sacred Heart, which members recite every day. May we be in solidarity with and friends of the people, apostles of kindness and truth, so that the gospel might become the heart of the world, end quote. The Secular Institute of the Missionary Priests of the Kingship of Christ was established in October 1953 in the Church of St. Damiano in Assisi. The centre which the Institute is constructing in Burundi will be dedicated to Archbishop Michael Courtney, who served as the Apostolic Nuncio to the country from 2000 and was shot to death there in 2003. He played a significant role in national reconciliation in the country. I'm Joseph Tullock. Passengers on the Alaska Airlines flight where the door blew off last week are suing Boeing. The aircraft's left side door plug detached last Friday mid-flight, causing the cabin to depressurize and forcing an emergency landing. The lawsuit says the incident caused economic, physical and emotional pain for those on the flight. The lawsuit comes as the FAA has opened an investigation into Boeing's quality control. The investigation will focus on whether the company failure to make its the company failed to make sure its products adhered to approved designs. And Bill Belichick and the New England Patriots have announced they are ending a historic 24 season run, parting ways mutually agreed upon. That's the news. It's 35 past the hour. Now you can use Venmo to give to Sacred Heart Radio. Just type in at Sacred Heart Radio, all one word, to give a gift of any amount. To help broadcast God's life-giving message over our seven media platforms, use Venmo at Sacred Heart Radio. Support for Sacred Heart Radio is from Schneller Knockelman Plumbing, Heating, and Air. Water heaters, plumbing repair, and drain cleaning backed by Schneller Knockelman's 100% satisfaction guarantee. Schneller Knockelman at skpha.com. skpha.com. St. Michael's Rosaries and Religious Articles in Miamisburg, a proud supporter of Sacred Heart Radio, can help deck the halls this Christmas. Heirloom quality nativities, advent wreaths, books, CDs, and much more. St. Michael's Rosaries, online at stmichaelscustomrosaries.com. You rely on your car, so rely on the experts at Fort Mitchell Garage, a proud supporter of Sacred Heart Radio. They can do it all from brakes, tires, and heating and cooling to towing and collision repair and more. Fort Mitchell Garage on Dixie Highway and Park Hills. On the web at fortmitchellgarage.com. It's 24 minutes before the hour on this feast of St. Aylred of Riveau, Friday, January the 12th. Your forecast is brought to you on Sacred Heart Catholic Radio by Schneller Knockeman Plumbing, Heating, and Air online at skpha.com. Precipitation returns today. Right now, temperatures in the upper 30s as you're heading out the door. For Cincinnati, rain is likely could be heavy at times with gusty afternoon and evening winds and a high today of 50 degrees. A wintry mix turns to wet snow tonight, but little to no accumulation. An overnight low of 25 Colder and windy tomorrow under mostly cloudy skies with a high of 30. For the Miami Valley Dayton area, rain and snow showers turning to all rain today. Windy as well with a high of 48. Rain this evening mixing and changing to scattered snow showers with an overnight low of 24. Cloudy, windy with a few flurries possible tomorrow and a high of 28. This is Sacred Heart Catholic Radio. The Sunrise Morning Show continues. I'm Matt Swaim, joined now by Bobby Schindler from the Terry Schiavo Life and Hope Network online at lifeandhope.com. Bobby, good morning. Good morning, Matt. Uh, With a new year, and uh, we talked about this last week, comes all kinds of new pushes for various kinds of legislation that uh, can have uh, very severe and damaging 
repercussions for the medically vulnerable. What's going on in the United States of, of America in various places? Because I know we've talked about various parts of the world already this year. Right, and, and I think, Matt, it's, it's good to keep reminding and, and letting people know uh, what's happening on this issue. Uh, it, it doesn't get nearly as much attention, I don't think, anyway, uh, as the abortion issue uh, receives, but but is, is equally, well, maybe not equally in the far as numbers, but it's it all connected. Because, it's all right, connected. Right. You throw away and one part, part of society, you're going to throw away everybody. Yep. That, absolutely, Matt, and that's why we fight so hard and advocate so hard for for people that are vulnerable to, to, to this death movement. And Alex Shattenberg, he's the uh, director, executive director of Euthanasia Prevention Coalition. He works out of Canada, but he really is very good at watching what's happening here in the United States. And he wrote an article uh, recently uh, talking about 10 states here in the United States that will be introducing legislation uh, to pass assisted suicide. And he expects more uh, additional states to also introduce bills and, and he explains the dangers, why uh, we need to monitor and push back. And he says, and he, and he says, Matt, which is interesting. He says, not all of these states will pass because uh, just because they're controlled uh, in a legislature that won't that that does not approve of assisted suicide. But but he also says that that there will be states that pass. And, and his big concern is New Jersey. Now, New Jersey ha- is already legalized assisted suicide. And and see, this is how the the death lobby circumvents. Uh, problems they might have passing laws in particular states. And, and why New Jersey is so concerning, because it already has assisted suicide legal in, in their books, so to speak. Uh, but now they are they launched a lawsuit in August trying to drop the residency requirements, meaning that you do not have to be a resident of New Jersey to qualify, uh, quote-unquote, for assisted suicide. So that's already occurring in Oregon and Vermont, where you can come from another state and, and choose assisted suicide. So say, for example, you live in Pennsylvania, you can travel to Vermont uh, and receive assisted suicide. So it just makes sense. So why are we concerned about New Jersey? Well, you have New York and uh, Pennsylvania bordering New Jersey. So you have two major metropolitan areas, one being New York City, the other being Philadelphia. And if they can access New Jersey to suicide clinics, uh, you can see how problematic and, you know, and, and how serious this could be, because you don't have to legalize, uh, although they'll keep trying in New York and Pennsylvania, you don't necessarily have to legalize it when you have New Jersey uh, allowing it uh, residents, uh, out-of-state residents to come there and, and commit suicide. So uh, it's just another way that they can, they can open the door for people to, uh, to use assisted suicide. So uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a good article. I think it's, it's worth people reading. And, and it just explains really how the, how the suicide lobby progresses and, and how they, once they pass laws, uh, Matt, how they intend to expand them once they're actually passed in these particular states. Well, and this has always been the strategy of the assisted suicide movement is to knock one state down and see how many other dominoes they can get to fall as a result of it. Because once one gets these things in place, then everybody else has got to figure out how to work around the one state that did do it. Um, so, I mean, this is this is a long-time strategy. But, you know, something else you sent me, I think that sometimes people can be like, well, this is one weird issue off to the side um, that only affects certain families who have, like, weird medical crises. But it's fascinating to me, Bobby, that, you know, when it comes to major moral issues of the day, uh, the Pope and the bishops tend to speak in, uh, in fairly general terms uh, about, like, you know, we should, you know, pray for peace or we should you know respect life or or whatever but it seems like when it comes to assisted suicide or it comes to taking the life of a child uh you know like charlie guard who's medically vulnerable like this is where the pope or like bishops sort of stand up and say hey listen i'm going to point to this specific thing and say don't do that (laughs) like this is one of the places where the church gets real clear Right, and 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 we see we're seeing that right now in in Minnesota, and and it's really encouraging, Matt, because we need leadership to to really uh, uh, publicly condemn what's happening, particularly with assisted suicide and youth and age. And it's one of my frustrations that we don't get more leadership uh, letting the uh, faithful Catholics know, and and really the public know, just how serious uh, assisted suicide is, and it's a violation against the teachings of the Church. And and recently. 
uh, Bishop Barron. Now, Minnesota is trying to pass assisted suicide. And, and even though what Bishop Barron says and condemns assisted suicide from Minnesota obviously applies uh, you know, everywhere, So because it is, it is against the teachings of the Church. And, and Bishop Barron, I mean, he does not mince, mince words, and, and he explains uh, clearly with clarity why this is wrong. And he says, he says, uh, this one quote, he says, even if a dying person found himself in great pain, actively killing himself would not be morally justifiable. The reason is that the direct killing of the innocent is, in the language of the Church, intrinsically evil, which is to say incapable of being morally sanctioned, no matter how extenuating the circumstances or how beneficial the consequences. And that, that was just the other, that was just January eighth in an article by the uh, Catholic News Agency. So it's it's really encouraging, as I said, Matt, that we have uh, someone like Bishop Barron who is so publicly condemning assisted suicide and euthanasia. And I and I hope we see more of this from leadership because Catholics need to know uh, that, that that this is wrong, and we need to fight back and push back against legalizing it in, in whatever state we live. And in some ways, Bobby, this is much more of a bipartisan issue than uh, even the abortion question. You know, sometimes uh, because of the way things have fallen and because of, well, stuff that's way too complicated to explain here, uh, the abortion question can fall like really neatly across conservative and liberal lines. But here's a question where We've seen some interesting ground and some interesting headway made uh, because, you know, if you're going to target the disabled, if you're going to target the poor, if you're going to target uh, people with mental illness, uh, then both the left and the right kind of perk up on that. <laughs> you know, we got some ground to 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 meet on uh, on uh, both sides of the aisle on some of these assisted suicide questions. And I'm hoping that we do more of that coming in through the, the new year and moving forward. You know, you're exactly right, Matt. And, and again, uh, much of this does not get it's, it's omitted by our, our mainstream media. In fact, the disability community is really a strong advocate against assisted suicide. And if you know anything about the disability community, they're not they necessarily lean left. You know, yeah, they, they, they sure do. <laughs> they absolutely do, which is a little strange to me. Why, why, why they they hold that position on, on certain life issues? But nonetheless. Uh, in fact, we saw it in my sister's case. There were, there were, I don't know if people realize this. Do you know there was 40 local and national disability groups that were supporting the life of my sister? I mean, you'll, you'll rarely find that in the mainstream media because they didn't want to identify this as a disability issue. And, and we see that in, in, the, uh, in the assisted suicide and euthanasia issue just, just as well. And, and I think you're right. This crosses the aisle. It does not particularly uh, affect uh, just one political party, but, but it really can... Uh, reach and has tentacles that, that can uh, affect every single one of us. So I, I think you're right. We, we have to uh, be vigilant and, and understand that this can affect so many of the population, and that's why we need to stop it. Yeah, it also has to do with questions of health care accessibility and a whole bunch of other things. So, uh, you know, who knows? Maybe we can get the conversation started when it comes to these ending life issues for the medically vulnerable and the elderly and like back them up and get people to better recognize the sanctity of life uh, from the moment of conception. Uh, so I'm always in favor of having that conversation and going as deep as people want to go. Uh, Bobby Schindler, if people want to find you and find your work, how do they do so? Sure. Thank you, Matt. It's lifeandhope.com, lifeandhope.com. Linked at sunrisemorningshow.com. Bobby Schindler, have a great day. Thank you, Matt. God bless you. All right, Father Jonathan Duncan joins us next, plus headlines with Anna Mitchell. It's 14 till. Are you looking for peace? Longing for joy? Want to meet the giver of all goodness? God is calling the laity to bring Ignatian prayer into the suffering world. Work for the new evangelization. Go to lordteachmetopray.com. Order your free digital training and manual. Find true happiness and everlasting joy. Go to lordteachmetopray.com and click on the red button today. It's free. Approved by the USCCB. For more than 150 years, the Comboni missionaries have traveled to nearly every corner of the world. Founded by St. Daniel Comboni, we are an international Catholic organization dedicated to ministering the world's poorest and most abandoned people. Your donations make a huge impact, and 95% are used to fund our many projects. 
Find out more at kombonimissionaries.org. That is kombonimissionaries.org. Business owners are starting to think outside the box to find new customers. You can reach millions of engaged Catholic listeners by underwriting the Sunrise Morning Show. Each weekday morning, listeners across the U.S. and around the globe can hear your message for your business, ministry, or nonprofit on the Sunrise Morning Show. To find out how it works, email me, Leah, at sacredheartradio.com. That's Leah at sacredheartradio.com. This is Jack Williams, General Manager of EWTN Radio. As we look forward to the new year, we want to thank you for listening and encourage you to stay tuned in the coming weeks for some exciting programming announcements that are sure to make 2024 the best year ever for EWTN Radio. As we strive to continue the legacy of evangelization born out of Mother Angelica's vision, please keep us in your prayers and know that we pray for you daily. God bless you all. Hi, this is Cy Kellett. Join us later today on Catholic Answers Live as we do our best to explain and defend the Catholic faith. Catholic Answers Live, 6 p.m. Eastern on EWTN Radio. Now, back to the Sunrise Morning Show. The Sunrise Morning Show continues. I'm Matt Swaim, joined now by Father Jonathan Duncan from the Diocese of Charleston. He's involved in all kinds of stuff down there. I say down there uh as far as he's concerned i'm up here so father duncan good morning good morning matt and you are way up there i'm way on way on up there way on up there but uh when it comes to the idea of calling we get some really powerful stuff on the lord calling people both in the first reading uh from the uh book of first samuel where samuel is called in the middle of the night by god we've got john uh, in his gospel, and there are apostles called in the middle of the day. It says it's four in the afternoon <laughs> in in the gospel reading, and of course we got some really powerful um, psalm stuff and some stuff from Paul in First Corinthians. But uh, are you going to focus on this theme of calling, or did you want to go outside the box? Where were you thinking of heading when you uh, started thinking about how to prepare for your homily this weekend? You know, I think. Um, it's, it's, it's a difficult one because I see like two, two equally pressing needs. One, you've got, um, St. Paul who's, who spoke both to a culture in his own day, a, a word that was incredibly revolutionary, but also revolutionary to us as well, which is the importance of the body, right? He lived in a time when just about every sensible religious person would have believed some version of, uh, yeah, we all have a soul, and the soul is immortal, and the soul is the real you, and it's going to live on after death, but you just have to die and shed this, you know, this mortal the, um, flesh. The mortal coil, right? Exactly right. The body right. is and a then, prison for the soul. And yes. then you get to have this wonderful spiritual life free of, of bodily distractions and all these other things. And Paul is like, uh-uh, no, no, no. The Christian vision is one where body and soul together is, is how you were made. You were made to be a, if, if God wanted just spiritual creatures, he would have made them. He did. They're called angels. Um, and so he, he made you to be body and soul. So Paul, like speaking to his culture, and it's, it's also a word that, that our culture now, as, as people in different ways, as, as kind of the new wisdom, is saying, well, your body is irrelevant to you. Your body is not the real you, or even you can carve up or, or poison the body if you feel like it's, it's, it's the wrong body. So that's a word we need to hear now. So I'm drawn to that, but I'm also drawn to um, our, our Old Testament reading where we hear this, you know, this verbal calling, and yet I think a lot of people are going to hear that and are going to say, that's what I want from God, right? Why don't I get that? You know, I pray, and why don't I hear a voice like that? And I think it's so important to, to realize that, you know, the book of Hebrews talks about this, that in, in many and diverse ways God spoke to his people of old. But in these last days, he has spoken to us through his Son, that Jesus is now, like, the definitive God speaking to us. And he comes to us, of course, through the voice of the Church, uh, through the Gospels, through, hear, you know, hearing his Word. Uh, he comes to us through fellow believers— um, and just in, in a many, many different ways we encounter 
that voice of Jesus. And I, because I think so many people are, are hungry and say, you know, I, I just, I wish I could hear him speaking. And I think realizing that we can receive his word, but that there were even people in the Old Testament and, and, and in the New Testament who, when the voice of God came to them, they weren't able to receive it. Um, you know, they, they weren't able to respond. And yet we've now received something greater than a prophecy, something greater even than what Samuel received. We've, we've received the Lord Jesus himself. So I think, I think that's such an essential piece as well. And, of course, we see the calling um, of those first disciples where John the Baptist is able to point and say, this is what we've been longing for. This is what we've been hoping for. Behold, the Lamb of God. This is not just a prophet. This is the one who's going to fulfill all of our longings, all of the sacrifices, all of it. And he points, and we begin to see people are, people are drawn to this Jesus as the fulfillment of God speaking to us. So I think there's a lot there. That we There's need to hear. a ton there. Uh, so, the uh, just to, to provide you know fuller context, the first reading that we're going to hear at mass this weekend is First Samuel, uh, chapter three. Samuel sleeping in the temple. Uh, he hears a voice that says, uh, you know, that that is calling him, and uh, Samuel says, "Here I am." Uh, he goes. He thinks it's uh, the prophet Samuel or prophet Eli in the other room and he goes in and Eli's like that wasn't me go back to sleep and he hears the voice again he goes back to Eli and he's like I'm not talking to you it, maybe it's the Lord right and so um, he says you know here I am Lord and then of course this is Samuel's commissioning as a prophet and those of you who may not be familiar with the scriptural text are probably at least familiar with the song here I am Lord is it I absolutely Lord? I have Heard you calling in the night. It's a literal reference to this particular passage of scripture, right? And I think that sometimes it's easy for us to discount those thoughts that keep us asleep, that keep us awake at night when we're trying to sleep, um, or the the things that are racing in our head, or the the weird things that mm-hmm. like that go through our minds as we're staring at the ceiling and think, "Ah, oh, that's just me going crazy." But maybe God's in that sometimes. I don't know about you, Father Absolutely. Duncan, but for some me, for for me. I feel like I get a lot of work done with God when I'm staring at the ceiling in the middle of the night. Absolutely, and the things that he puts on your heart. And if you, if you hear this reading on Sunday and you're, and you're kind of frustrated and you think, you know, why don't I get a word like that? Just remember that for most of God's people in the Old Testament and in the New, like most of them did not get these kinds of visions, these kinds of words. You know, you open up the book of Ruth, you open up the book of Esther. It's not people getting these booming voices. It's faithful people discerning what is the will of God, what is his, uh, his word to us through the scriptures and, and through a variety of ways. Think of all the people that followed Moses out of Israel. They were relying on one guy that got the word, Absolutely. <laughs> you know, uh, rather than their own individual private revelations. And that's part of our, our calling in the church is that we are we're encountering Christ through now the communion of his church, through his body, of which uh, our individual bodies are, are part of that body. And so that's how we're going to encounter God's definitive word, which is Jesus, now. Um, and it doesn't make that word any less real. In fact, it makes it the fulfillment. Father Jonathan Duncan, great stuff. Have a great day. All right. That wraps it up here on a Friday morning. Hard to believe we've already blasted through a whole nother week here in 2024, but we'll be back again on Monday for our EWTN listening family. More stuff coming up for our local listeners. But in the meantime, please do consider checking out some of the guests that we talk to on a regular basis. Uh, They're all linked in the show notes at sunrisemorningshow.com. That's where you can find our Facebook live stream, our YouTube stream, all the book links, all the everything. And while you're there, subscribe, and we'll send you our show notes to your inbox daily so you can just wake up and they'll be right there. I'm Matt Swain. We'll talk to you again on a Monday. May God bless you and keep you and grant you his peace. I'm Father Rob Jack. 
Join me this afternoon for Driving Home the Faith when Gene Mancini will discuss the March for Life coming up in Washington, D.C. Dr. Jennifer Roback Morris will share the latest news from the Ruth Institute. I will reflect on the miracles that Jesus performed in his life, plus frequent traffic and weather to get you home safely. That's this afternoon beginning at 4 on Sacred Heart Radio. You're on the road to Christ the King. Driving home the faith. Support for Sacred Heart Radio is from St. Margaret Hall, an assisted living and skilled nursing facility sponsored by the Carmelite Sisters for the Aged and Infirmed. St. Margaret Hall has been providing loving care to the community for over 50 years. At St. Margaret Hall, your loved ones will receive 24-hour care from dedicated professionals with newly renovated stylish assisted living units. At St. Margaret Hall, the difference is love. On Madison Road, 513-751-5880. On the web at stmargarethall.com. Support for Sacred Heart Radio is from Hoting Realtors. Equipped with the latest technology and market knowledge, Hoting Realtors can make the buying and selling process easier. 513-451-4800 and Hoting.com. Support for Sacred Heart Radio is from Stegman Landscape. Serving the tri-state since 1979, Stegman Landscape can create a picture-perfect landscape all year long. From design, installation, and maintenance to retaining walls, patios, and outdoor fireplaces to enjoy any season, Stegman Landscape can do it all. Stegman Landscape, making the world more beautiful one yard at a time. 859-781-1562 and online at stegmanlandscape.com. Catholic Engaged Encounter Weekends are a marriage preparation program led by married couples and a priest or deacon. What makes this marriage prep program unique is you will have two days as a couple to delve into important subjects that will affect your relationship together for the rest of your lives. More time for prayer and reconciliation and closing the weekend with Mass. More information is at cincinnati-covington.engagedencounter.com. That's cincinnati-covington.engagedencounter.com. Pregnancy Center West is committed to protecting the unborn by encouraging women to see and choose the beauty of life while offering practical assistance for them and their families. Donate securely online at supportpcw.org. That's supportpcw.org. Support for Sacred Heart Radio is from Molly Maid of Westchester. Insured, screened, and drug-free employees deliver service with a 100% satisfaction guarantee. 1-800-MOLLY-MAID or at mollymaid.com. Molly Maid, a clean you can trust. This is Father Benedict Kroll, the Director of Mission Advancement for the Angelicum in Rome. Thank you for listening to Sacred Heart Catholic Radio. 740 WNOP Newport, 910 WPFB Middletown, or get the app, stream, podcast, and more at sacredheartradio.com. Arise, it's a new day. Hear his word, let us pray. The sunrise morning show. 